Um, so basically anything that you type into the conversation here will be recorded as well. This is a public agency at a public meeting and we will be posting this on our website. So just keep that in mind. Um, and uh, what we're going to try to do is run through this presentation. And if you have any questions about any particular components, uh, please type your question into the conversation tab here. And we'll try to answer them at the very end of the conversation, the end of the, the uh, webinar. Um, so I won't be going back and forth as we're going through it. We'll just finish the presentation and then come back to the questions. And um, our program manager, Nicole Dabrowski, is going to be collecting all the questions that people ask. And then at the end, she'll, she'll send me the questions and we'll answer them as best as we can. So um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. So let's get started. So yeah, so these are the, the biofouling management regulations that are, have been recently been adopted here for California. Uh, before we go into the main components, I do want to spend one slide to just talk about why we're here doing what we're doing. And it's to address some of the concerns surrounding biofouling, vessel biofouling from vessels that operate in California waters. A um, couple of main concerns. One is the biosecurity concern. So um, there are, there is a, a risk of introducing non-indigenous species from vessels that have biofouling organisms on their weighted surfaces. And the state legislature in California has tasked our agency with addressing those risks. And that's what we were doing, we are doing through these regulations. And obviously there is also a concern from the shipping industry's perspective. Uh, fouled holes lead to increased drag when the vessels move through the water and that increases fuel consumption and operating costs. And so we have a shared goal, both the regulators and the regulated industry to minimize biofouling accumulation on the weighted surfaces of the ships. And so um, it's one of those rare instances where we're all on the same page. And so hopefully we can find some answers that work for everyone. So these are the, the actual regulations. It's our Article 4.8 biofouling management regulations to minimize the transfer of non-indigenous species from vessels arriving at California ports. These regulations were approved by our commission in April of this year. They were filed by our Secretary of State in August of this year, becoming you know, official, and their effective date is October 1st, 2017. So that's in a week and a half. And so it was important for us to have this webinar and get, do as much outreach as we can prior to the implementation date. <clears throat> um, before we actually get into the different components, I wanted to talk briefly about the process we went through to develop these regulations. This was a public process. We went through three separate public rulemaking actions. And within each of those rulemaking actions, we released a, a draft for public comment collected the responses and the comments from general public, revised the regulations, put them back out for more public comments, and collected comments, revised again, and did that several times. And we did that for each of the three rulemaking actions. And so in all, there were eight different drafts that the public was able to comment on. Um, there were more drafts prior to that. Um, the second bullet, we developed these regulations in consultation with stakeholders through a technical advisory group that we've been meeting with since 2010. And so we discussed a variety of different drafts, earlier drafts with that group to come up with what we came up with at the end. Um, this stakeholder advisory group included a lot of shipping industry representatives. So ship owners, operators, trade groups, in water cleaning uh, vendors, dry docking representatives, anti-fouling coating manufacturers. Also a lot of different regulators at the state, federal and inter international level. And then researchers who focus on biofouling and bioinvasions. Uh, these regulations were informed by over eight years of vessel reported data on biofouling management and operational practices, and over 10 years of funded biofouling research to give us a, a better idea about how those management and operational practices that we were collecting information on actually influence the patterns of biofouling that we see on vessels in California. 
So this is what we'll be covering today. Um, basically, the main components that are contained within these biofouling management regulations. So the applicability, biofouling management plan and record book requirements, the annual vessel reporting form, biofouling management for wetted surfaces, extended residency periods, propeller cleaning, alternatives, and emergency exemptions. So first with the applicability, um, the state legislature granted authority to our commission over vessels that are 300 gross registered tons and above that are carrying or capable of carrying ballast water. And so that, since that's the jurisdiction that we've been granted, those are the vessels that are subject to these requirements. Um, and that's my indicator to mention again that this is this meeting is being recorded. So if anyone joined us late, I uh, just wanted to mention that this meeting is being recorded and we ask that you ask your questions through the conversation tab and we'll get to the questions at the very end. But just keep in mind that those questions will also be recorded and will be part of the, the public record. So first, um, we have a biofouling management plan and a biofouling record book requirement. Um, when are these required? For existing vessels, they're required after the first regularly scheduled out of water maintenance on or after January 1st, 2018. For new vessels, it's upon delivery on or after January 1st, 2018. And we are providing a 60 day grace period if a vessel does not have either the biofouling management plan or a biofouling record book or both during their first arrival at a California port after the requirement is in effect. So an example here is if a vessel goes into a dry dock and has their a regularly scheduled out of water maintenance in 2016, prior to these rules going into effect, their next one is likely to be 2021. So that vessel will not be subject to these requirements until they come out of that dry dock in 2021. So what's specifically required in this biofouling management plan? So first and foremost, it has to be vessel specific. So it has to be specifically developed for that vessel. It has to be retained on board and be made available to commission staff for inspection and review. And it has to describe the biofouling management strategy for the vessel. It has to maintain consistency with the IMO biofouling guidelines and specifically the biofouling management plan that's described in the IMO biofouling guidelines. It has to describe biofouling management practices and anti-fouling systems that are in use on that vessel. And we are asking also for specific details for anti-fouling coatings and marine growth prevention systems. So essentially it's the strategy that will be used to manage biofouling on this vessel. The record book, on the other hand, also has to be retained on board. It has to contain the details of all inspections and biofouling management measures undertaken since the most recent out of water maintenance or since delivery for new vessels. It also has to maintain consistency with the IMO biofouling guidelines. And it has to describe uh, the completed niche area management practices that we'll touch on in a couple of slides. So. While the biofouling management plan describes the strategy to manage biofouling on a vessel, this record book is intended to document the implementation of that strategy. We also are requiring an annual vessel reporting form that's to be submitted once per year, once per calendar year. So this requirement starts October 1st, 2017 and it's required to be submitted 24 hours in advance of the vessel's first California port arrival during a calendar year. So for example, in 2018, if a vessel makes its first arrival in February to a California port, then it's required on that arrival. If it makes its first arrival in November of 2018, then it's required 24 hours prior to that arrival. During 2017, since this requirement starts three quarters of the way through the year, it's only required from vessels that are making their first California port arrival of 2017 on or after October 1st. 
if the vessel came to California prior to October 1st of this year, they do not need to submit this form during this calendar year. They're still required, however, to submit the full husbandry reporting form and the annual vessel treatment technology reporting or annual form that I'll talk about on the next slide, because those are still required prior to October 1st. So this is just an overview of what we currently require in terms of reporting forms and what will be required as of October 1st. Currently require two different annual reporting forms. One is the hull husbandry reporting form, and the other is the annual ballast water treatment technology form. Through these regulations, we have combined those two forms into one annual vessel reporting form and deleted the requirement to submit the previous ones. So we're going from two forms to one. We also currently require a supplemental ballast water treatment technology form that now is redundant with an, because we collect similar information through the Coast Guard's recently modified ballast water management report. And so we're also removing that requirement to submit that form. So in all, we deleted three current forms and we're replacing with one form here with do these regulations. And the idea is to streamline the reporting process, reduce the administrative burden on the shipping industry and on ourselves. The, the burden that it takes to submit and complete and track and process these forms is now more streamlined. And one of the other changes, the annual forms are currently required 60 days after we request them from the vessel. This new annual vessel reporting form, as I mentioned on the previous slide, will be required 24 hours in advance of the first arrival at a California port for each calendar year. And we're collecting this 24 hours in advance because it allows us to conduct pre-arrival risk assessments and prioritize the vessels that get boarded and inspected um, so that we can we can prioritize our resources that way. Now I wanted to briefly touch on a new online form submittal tool that we recently developed. It's the misp.io application. So essentially it's the web the uh, web address is right there on the right hand side, misp.io. And through this application tool, you can fill out and submit your annual vessel reporting form and the ballast water management report directly online, and it'll go right into our, our quarantine for our database. And so there are some steps here. I just wanted to quickly point out in the green circle is the help button, and there's a nice help document there to walk you through the process of setting up an account, um, finding the vessels that you're responsible for, and submitting forms. The red circle there is showing the sign up, sign in tab, and that's how you would set up your initial account. This is the page that you would see if you click that button, and this is where you normally would sign in if you already had an account. If you do not have an account, if you're signing up new, circle there in red at the bottom, the little link there to, to sign up and um, it will walk you through the process. So back to the requirements. And again, I wanted to mention for anyone that has joined us late that this meeting is being recorded and anything you type into the conversation question-wise or otherwise will be recorded as well. So um, there, we have requirements for um, biofiling management of the wetted surfaces of the vessel. So again, when is this required? And it follows a similar pattern to the biofiling management plan and record book. So for existing vessels, it's after the first regular, regularly scheduled out of water maintenance on or after January 1, 2018. For new vessels, it's upon delivery on or after January 1, 2018. So what's required here? So if the vessel is using an anti-fouling or a foul release coating, it should not be aged beyond the effective coating lifespan. So for example, a vessel that is using an anti-fouling coating at a dry film thickness that is expected to last 36 months should only be using that for 36 months. And if they try to use it for 60 months, um, it falls outside of that expected coating lifespan. So if the vessel is using a coating that is within the expected coating lifespan, that's the requirement. There's nothing else for them to do. 
if they're outside of that expected coding lifespan, then the vessel must document in their biofouling management plan how they will manage biofouling in the absence of a coding that's within its lifespan. And conversely, if a vessel is not using an anti-fouling or a foul release coding, then they also must document in their biofouling management plan how they will manage biofouling in the absence of, of a, a biofouling a prevention coding. We also have requirements for managing certain niche areas from the vessels. So specifically, a vessel's sea chests and sea chest gratings, bow and stern thrusters and their gratings, fin stabilizers and recesses for vessels that have stabilizers, out of water support strips, propellers and propeller shafts, and rudders. And the requirement here is that these areas must be managed in some way. So whatever way that the owner or the operator determines is most appropriate for that vessel and its operational profile. But these areas must be managed in some way and those practices must be documented in the, must be described in the biofouling management plan and documented in the biofouling record book. We also have a provision for vessels that experience extended residency periods. So this is defined as staying in the same port for 45 days or longer. But this requirement follows the other requirement that I mentioned earlier, where um, existing vessels are required to, or the requirement is effective for existing vessels after the first regularly scheduled out of water maintenance on or after January 1 of 2018, and for new vessels upon delivery on or after January 1 of 2018. So what's required here? So these vessels that spend 45 days or longer in the same port are required to manage biofouling in their niche areas that we listed earlier in a manner that's consistent with their biofouling management plan and with how they describe how they would manage those areas. Um, those management actions and all other management actions that occurred during or after that extended residency period must be documented in the vessel's biofouling record book. We have a provision in there that touches on propeller cleaning. This is merely a clarifying provision that essentially states that through these regulations, we are not prohibiting propeller cleaning. So there really is no, no requirement here. We're just stating that these regulations do not prohibit do not prohibit these regulations, um, propeller cleaning. And then finally, we have an alternatives section and an emergency exemption section. So the alternatives provide a blueprint for how a vessel owner operator crew can petition for an alternative approach to achieve the goals of the regulations. So these we know that there are unique circumstances that require alternative management, and this is an opportunity for vessels that fall into those categories to work with us to achieve similar outcomes. The emergency exemption section sets specific criteria that would allow exemptions under certain emergency situations. So for example, if a vessel is transiting past California, but not planning to come into one of our ports, but for because of an emergency, either to the vessel or the, the crew has to make an emergency stop it at a California port, they're eligible for an emergency exemption and this section lays out how they would go about claiming that. So again, the, these regulations were approved by our commission on April 20th of 2017. They were filed by our Secretary of State in August and they are being implemented on October 1st of this year. The final rulemaking documents are on our website there, www.slc.ca.gov. Uh, we also have been doing a lot of outreach. So this webinar is one of several efforts to try to get the word out. We had a customer service meeting at the Port of Long Beach yesterday. We will be having another customer service meeting up in the San Francisco Bay Area in Martinez, California next Tuesday, September 6th, 26th at 10 a.m. We also have been developing some outreach materials for the vessels. So we have some information sheets that are 
marine safety specialist will be distributing to the vessels that they inspect starting on October 1st to get the word out. And we also are developing a guidance document for these regulations that we will also post to our website um, within a week. So prior to the October 1st implementation date. And before we get to the questions at the end, I just wanted to briefly clarify some of the questions that we've been getting about our another set of regulations, the Article 4.9 enforcement regulations that went into effect in July of this year. So these regulations, the 4.9 enforcement regulations, did not establish any new ballast water management or biofiling management requirements. It's, it's basically a tool for us to outline potential penalties for violations of existing requirements. And it outlines the structure, the preliminary actions, and the hearing process for potential penalties. So again, there were no new ballast water or biofiling management requirements added through this these Article 4.9 enforcement regulations. There have been a lot of questions about that. Um, so with that, um, I think we'll probably move on towards the questions. Just wanted to, again, thank everybody for participating. Um, there's contact information up there. If you have any questions after this webinar or if we don't have a chance to get to all of the questions, by all means, send us your questions and we'll be happy to, to reach out and, and share as much information as we can. So um, we're, we want to make sure that everybody is well prepared for this. So, I think with that, I didn't get an email from Nicole, so I think we might just try to scroll up here. We had some issues with audio. Okay, so for those of you that had issues with listening to this, it is being recorded and we will post this later so you'll be able to hear what we said. Um, so here's a question I see from um, Gina Pace, actually from John Bird first. I assume you will be repeating this in Martinez and yes, we'll be talking about all of these topics in Martinez. Uh, from Gina Pace, if a vessel is home ported in California waters at all times during the year, when is the annual vessel reporting form due for the year? On January 1 of each year? So the requirement is if it arrives at a California port during the calendar year. So if the vessel is home ported, it never arrives during that calendar year. So I believe we'll have to, to confer with our attorneys, but I think the answer would be that the vessel, um, yeah, either A, it, it's due on January 1st and we work with you to get it, or B, it's not required because there was no port arrival during that year. But we will confer with our attorneys and get back to you on that. Um, oh, there's Nicole Denser. So John, for some of the data on historical port call information may be difficult to gather prior to arrival, especially if a vessel has changed ownership and not all log data is at hand. Can vessels get extensions if requested? I think our, our, our approach is to work with the industry as much as possible. So if there is an issue that arises from a change in ownership, then definitely we will work with the vessel to get that information as soon as possible. Um, regarding the form, same is to be reported annually, but it's referring to the latest dry dock. This means that information reported in later forms will be accumulate information already reported the year before, as most vessels will not need cleaning out of water, cleaning, not need out of water cleaning every year. Are we supposed to include activities, even activities reported the year before? So yeah, so the, each reporting year is intended to be a snapshot of the fleet's activities and that vessel's activities prior to the first arrival coming into California that year. So the risk assessment that we conduct each year will be dependent on 
that vessel's prior history before coming into California that year. So yes, that information is still relevant. Does the biofouling management plan need to be approved or certified by anyone, example DNV, or is it just required to follow the IMO guidelines? So the answer is no, it does not need to be approved or certified by anyone, class. Um, the, uh, it, can, it can be in any form. So we've gotten a lot of questions about the form or how, how the biofouling management plan or record book should look. And as long as the required information is present on the vessel and is made available to our commission staff for inspection and review, it can be in any form. It doesn't need to be approved by class or approved by the Coast Guard or the IMO or anyone. It just has to be there. So it can be inserted into a ballast water management plan if that's what the vessel owner wants to do. It can be kept electronically if that's what the vessel owner wants to do. Um, yeah, so there, there really is no required format. We'll see that there are a variety of different templates out there that are useful. So the IMO guidelines has a template for a biofiling management plan. I know there are a lot of other classification societies and coatings manufacturers that have put out templates for a biofiling management plan and the uh, Institute for Marine Engineering Science and Technology together with the International Paint and Printing Inc. Council also put out a template. So all of these templates can be used or they can develop one the vessel owner or operator can develop one specifically for that vessel, but it is the, re the responsibility of the owner or the operator or the uh, person in charge of the vessel and the master to have a management plan that meets the requirements. So down here, how is compliance enforced? So as I mentioned, we have a team of marine safety specialists who go on board vessels and conduct inspections for currently for ballast water management requirements and they will also be conducting biofouling management requirement uh, inspections in the future. I mentioned also briefly that we have a, a set of enforcement regulations our 4.9 regulations and those will also be updated to include these new requirements um, that we are now adopting. How is the data reported in the annual vessel reporting form evaluated, i.e. If, if the responses indicate that a vessel may be fouled, is any action taken further information requested? So we will be using that information, as I mentioned, to assess the risk that the vessel presents prior to arrival. And if the vessel is deemed a high risk of introducing non-indigenous species, then it will be prioritized for inspection and our inspectors will go out and conduct an inspection on it and ensure that it, it's or assess whether or not the vessel is compliant with the requirements. So they will be inspected if they are deemed a high risk. Are the biofouling management plans re required of each vessel evaluated in any way to determine if the plan sufficiently addresses biofouling for that vessel? If so, how? Um, I believe this question is getting at how we will evaluate if the management plan is sufficient and our marine safety specialists will be looking at whether or not the vessel's management plan at, at a minimum meets the requirements set out through these regulations and our intent is to also evaluate the, the, the waterline fouling and if possible any other amount of fouling that we're able to identify and see over the long term what types of practices are working well and what types of practices may not be working well. And our goal is to try to get as much information as possible so we can provide better guidance in the future. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, if not, then as I said earlier, we're happy to continue answering questions throughout. If you want to follow up now or follow up later, you have our contact information. So here's another one. Does the current ship visit fee, newly raised and approved, cover the cost of this or are new fees going to be enacted for biofiling inspections, et cetera? So there are no new fees that will be enacted for these regulations. These are part of the Marine Invasive Species Program. And the, the fee that Brian is referring to here is 
goes into the Marine Invasive Species Control Fund that covers all of the activities for the program. So um, short answer, there will be no increase in the fees as a result of these regulations, and there's no additional fee as a result of these regulations. So I, I guess that's it for now, and I apologize for the people that had had trouble listening in, and hopefully their answers were asked by some, their questions were asked by someone else. Um, if not, um, upon listening to this webinar later, hopefully they can reach out to us and ask their questions in. So here's another one. What would weigh more? Flawless documentation and records or fouling free holes or are both equally important? So that's a good question. It's one of the things that we're hoping to, to analyze here. There are requirements that the vessel is expected to meet. And so in terms of whether a vessel is compliant or not, it, it, it all falls on whether they're doing the required, um, they're meeting the required requirements that we set out in these regulations. In terms of what it does to the fouling on the hull, um, ideally, that if a vessel is following these rules, then the vessel will have less fouling than they would if they weren't following the rules. So that's that's something that we will be evaluating over time. And because these are regulations, there are opportunities in the future to revise them if necessary. Um, is your program linked to the U.S. Coast Guard Port State Control Program? So that problems identified by SLC inspectors would or could result in targeting by U.S. Coast Guard. We do talk frequently with the U.S. Coast Guard, and we are notified from time to time when when they identify a vessel that is potentially out of compliance with our requirements. So we we do have that communication. Uh, the Coast Guard, to my knowledge, does not have any biofouling management requirements um, similar to what we are requiring. They, there are some biofouling management plan and record book requirements as well. So um, we do have those conversations. So I guess the short answer is yes. We, we would be probably alerting each other when we, when we see violations. <clears throat> the details of anti-fouling paint systems are part of the federal VGP ENOI cannot State Lands Commission take them from there rather than from a reporting form biofouling management plan. The details that are collected through the ENOI are, are different, slightly different, and I don't believe they're available real time. Um, I would have to, to double check with them, but I do not believe they're available real time. And our, our goal here is to, to do a pre-arrival risk assessment and to have our inspection staff, our marine safety specialists that go on board the vessels, have the opportunity to assess compliance at that time. So that's a good question. We will follow up as well. So I think that looks like the end of the questions. Um, any more trickle in, we'll try to answer them. And I'll stick around for a while here, but I think we could I just want to thank everybody again for joining us, um, for listening and asking your questions. And I know as you go through the requirements later on and as we start moving into the implementation dates, you'll have more questions. And our goal is to answer them as soon as you have them. So please send them to us, call us, email us, and um, we're happy to work with the industry to make sure that everyone is well aware of what the requirements are and hopefully with the the, the joint goal of minimizing biofouling on vessels but in services we can encourage better compliance so so thank you appreciate everyone joining us Like I said, I'll, I'll stick around on this in case anyone else has any questions over the next few minutes, but I think we can close the meeting. So thank you.
So Mark, <clears throat> after the presentation, will be available on the website so they can share it with other company members. And yes, our goal is to share this, post this to our website. Um, I'm not sure how quickly we can get it up, but hopefully by the end of the week or midweek next week. But it will be up shortly. So just check the website and, and it should be up soon and definitely before the October 1st date. Oh, so Kelly asked about, <clears throat> sorry, Kelly asked about um, when will the MISP.io system go live for sign up and sign in? And it's live now, so you can go and create an account right now. The annual vessel reporting form capability is not yet live, but you can still log in. You can submit uh, ballast water management reports. You can select vessels that you're responsible for. And our goal is to have the annual vessel reporting, I'm sorry, yeah, the annual vessel reporting forum capability up and running by October 1st when it's required. But the short answer is you can log in now and create an account now. Okay, well, I'm going to close this then and stop the record. Oops, I got another question. Okay, so Kelly is having issues with the MISP.io. And yeah, so just give us a call tomorrow and we'll, we'll walk you through it and try to answer whatever questions you might have. So thank you. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording now and I guess we'll close the meeting officially. So thank you again, everybody, for participating and um, appreciate everyone's time. <clears throat>